multilingual scholar, a former journalist, and an independent politician who has accepted to join one of Europe's right-wing populist governments, she now represents a country that is driving the EU's anti-immigrant agenda. An expert on the Middle East, she's become one of Austria's most colorful and vocal cabinet ministers, and even had Vladimir Putin at her wedding last year. I'm Rida Fakhri in Davos, and I'm speaking with Karen Kneissel, Austria's foreign minister, one-on-one. -on -one. Madam Minister, thanks very much for You're being welcome. with us. So Austria recently um, ended its presidency of the Council of the European Union. As you know, the EU is going through quite turbulent times with the whole Brexit issue. Do you feel that the UK is making a mistake by leaving the EU? This is a decision that was taken by the voters in the United Kingdom. I would never call that a mistake or anything else. It's a purely internal affair. Uh, by the British, uh, and uh, we accepted it. I think uh, this has to be done in a democratic procedure. But what do you think it suggests about the wave of popular resentment and dissatisfaction there seems to be in many European countries these days about the increasing powers of, of Brussels? Do you think, for example, if there was a referendum, a similar referendum in countries like Hungary, the Czech Republic, even Austria, with populist governments, that people would not follow suit? Well, first of all, let me reject the notion of populist government. I consider myself as a minister of a government that was elected in a democratic way, like it's the case in most countries on the globe, and uh, I don't uh, appreciate this term, populism. No, you, I mean, you may be an independent yeah, no, no, politician, it has nothing but to the do government with, no. is yeah, seen, but the Freedom Party is yeah, seen but as a right-wing Yeah, but uh, again, party, whatever you it? call it, no, right-wing or whatever, but when you take the semantic root of mm. populism, where does it come from? From populous people. I mean, uh, it says in our constitution very clearly, all power stems from the people, populous, yeah? So uh, I let me reject at this point of our talk uh, the term populist because I, I simply don't take it. Uh, and uh, so to come back to your question, no, uh, because having observed the cumbersome procedures, having observed the uncertainty that prevails now in the British uh, uh, public opinion, but above all also among investors, companies, employers, so. Uh, according to findings, and this is now not my personal opinion, we speak here of empirical findings by Eurostat, uh, the desire to have a skeptical view of the European Union or even maybe ask for a leaving has tremendously declined in Austria. I can't speak of Hungary, I don't know the statistics in Hungary, but when it comes to Austria there's not the slightest desire to leave the European Union. Fine, uh, be, be that as it may, I, I want to get back to your rejection of the notion of populist because it, when anyone looks at the statements that have been made in Austria by the Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, the term that is often used is populist to describe him and his statements. And just one, one example is uh, him recently making the remarks that uh, he would like to see some kind of a, an anti-immigrant nexus being created with Germany and Italy and Austria. He wants to increase the borders and security to keep uh, refugees and immigrants outside well, of Austria. What, what do you describe this rhetoric? I don't describe it as populist. I risk, I, uh, and it's not an anti-immigration uh, topic. It's about, it's the obligation of every government to control its border and its territory. That's written down in the constitution. And uh, axis might have been uh, not the proper term, but again, it's not up to me to judge uh, that uh, what is in place is, uh, or what is in need, and Chancellor Merkel herself has stated it last year, is uh, more cooperation. Sometimes you do it on a bilateral level, sometimes on a trilateral level, because unfortunately so far we have been not been able to achieve uh, clear-cut decisions on migration, on common standards, on uh, asylum seekers among the 28. And one of the main problems that we have seen in 2015, 2016, is that um, uh, let us take a country like Portugal. Portugal had offered more than 70,000 places for resettlement of Syrian uh, refugees. Uh, this, uh, this offer was rejected by many because for the simple reason that social benefits in Sweden or Germany are higher. Sure, but let's talk about Austria. Austria, many people would argue, is moving increasingly towards a less tolerant 
a place. Let me reject uh, that. Let me, let me just, may yeah, but may I reject that on, on, on the very that, first ground? Let me just because say, for the very, if, if, I may, if I may interfere here, because who has taken the highest number of refugees? May I ask you? Germany has. No, per capita. I, I speak now In of, terms of, of per capita. Yeah. Who has done that? Well, if you if so, you so if, 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 if Austria uh, has done that, then please answer yeah, this question. Yeah. Why did Austria not participate in the Marrakesh Migration Compact Conference? And why did it refuse to officially back the non-binding Global Compact for Migration? For the, uh, for the very evident reason, like many other countries did, um, that we cannot agree with 12 out of 23 uh, uh, objectives in there. For instance, and I speak here also as a former independent correspondent, I don't like the obligation that uh, public funds should go to editorial offices who write nicely about migration and those who have a skeptical opinion should not get any public funds. This is a form of censorship and I myself as a correspondent was affected by that back in 2015 when I voiced a critical opinion about what was going on. I myself, uh, speaking Arabic, I did a lot of interpretation for people in refugee shelters and I can tell after two sentences whether somebody is from Syria or is from Morocco. And we had, for instance, a, a high number of Moroccans coming to Austria. And here we don't speak of political refugees, we speak of migrants. And if I may just put one thing clear here, we, we accepted completely the refugee compact, but we voted in abstention when it came to the migration compact. So at the General Assembly, we abstained. But let me just, again, pick on something you said. You talked about the importance of protecting one's borders, and of course it's the duty of every government. But would you agree that there are different ways of doing it and that the political discourse is important? You mentioned that you speak Arabic, and I know that you have uh, huge expertise and knowledge about the culture, the languages, the history of the Middle East, having lived and taught there for many years. So perhaps you may be more sensitive to the perceived Muslim threat, Sorry, quote unquote, I don't, I don't, that some, I don't take it that because some in the EU see because and, and I have been speaking. Into their yeah, but if I may interfere here, uh, you know what uh, what irritates most of my friends in the Middle East that uh, hundreds of thousands of people were admitted to enter without even showing their papers, with only by saying asylum, while others who come for education, who do who do business have to go through a very cumbersome process. And most of my colleagues, also those I have been to Syria very regularly over the last years, most of my colleagues my age, I was born in 1965, they tell me, you see, I don't speak Swedish, I don't speak German, I don't want to spend now the next few years in a refugee shelter somewhere in Europe. So it's not about an anti-Muslim feeling or so on, most of my colleagues, whether they are in Damascus, in Beirut or somewhere else, they don't understand the behavior of many European governments back in 2015. Okay, well, before moving on to other issues, let me just briefly, though, touch on something that was just said on Sunday by the Italian Deputy Prime Minister. He talked about the need to tackle the root causes of immigration. He says that some European countries, chiefly France, has uh, played a detrimental role in impoverishing a lot of African countries that they colonize and pushing them onto European shores. Does he have a point? Does Europe have a responsibility to bear? Uh, I refrain from commenting other people's position. This is not my position. That's not my role as Minister for Foreign Affairs. I'm responsible for the Austrian foreign policy. And mm -hmm. as a, as a uh, sorry, I don't comment other people. If you have he's checked... Called, he's called on EU sanctions against France. What would you say uh, to that? Well, I, I don't comment him simply for that. You see, there are certain things which I simply refrain commenting. All right, let's move on, if we can, to uh, the wider Middle East. And you mentioned the fact that you speak Arabic. And I heard you make a speech in Arabic at the UN General Assembly, your first speech as foreign minister of Austria. In it, you made some interesting remarks. You said that after World War I, the Middle East was shaped by the oil industry. The new map of the region was based on pipelines, and then the borders were drawn. Exactly. You also said that the recent Middle East wars were fought in the name of oil. Has much changed since those days? Because Trump is quite blunt when he said, let's just take the oil. Uh, to a certain extent, little has changed. And when we take also the war of uh, 2003, I was one of the voices that said, don't make war in Iraq. It was very much about oil interests. 
so uh, it continues. I mean, the, the, the Middle East remains an object of desire because of its fossil reserves. And we are observing one of my, the latest book that I published before turning into minister was on the role of China as a geopolitical actor and not just as an investor. And here we see, we have been watching it over the last 15 years, the pipelines and also airlines keep turning east and not west. And so what lessons do you think the Europeans have learned about the Middle East? And would you say there is one cogent Middle East policy toward the Middle East? No, we don't have a very coherent Middle East policy because inter alia uh, of the historic responsibilities, uh, you mentioned colonialism, uh, we have always had special roles seen by certain capitals in Europe. Uh, we have uh, the responsibility of certain countries in Europe when it comes to the Holocaust. So all that has always been an inherent feature to divergent opinions uh, to versus also different countries in the Middle East. Uh, so this is not something that we can just uh, get out of the equation. Uh, but since you asked me on oil and gas, uh, it's not anymore Europe that is the number one client of Middle East on oil and gas, it's Asia. You mentioned Asia, but looking at, at uh, the EU and the interesting dynamics that are taking shape there, you say there's no one EU policy toward the Middle East. How would you look at EU policy toward Russia these days? Um, would, you th would you say that or accept the fact that um, the EU may have put itself in a box when it comes to the situation of Crimea and Georgia and even the attempted murder of the Skripals in the UK, imposing sanctions since 2014, renewing them just recently in December? Has it really boxed itself? Has it overreacted? What's the way out? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that it's overreacted because annexation of territory is violation of international law. And um, that, uh, the, the consequence of that has been sanctions, which as you just described, have been prolonged. You have an old relationship with Vladimir Putin, a personal relationship. He came to your wedding back in August at the height of these tensions with the EU. Uh, some people saw it as a Russian PR stunt. Others saw you waltz with him, but read more into it. Was there more, more of a political dance going on there? Uh, it's, uh, I, I know that journalists love to overinterpret things, but uh, one just should just stick to the facts. But what are the facts? The fact that he, I invited him spontaneously, he attended, and that's it. And you said at the time it was a personal matter, exactly. but I mean, you are a personal figure, the foreign minister of Austria. Were you sending some kind of I messages as well that there's two Europe's when it comes to dealing no. with Russia? No, there you are overinterpreting. My answer is no. <laughs> okay, clear, no answer. Moving on to uh, Iran, if I may. Uh, on the Iranian issue, another thorn in the side of EU-US relations with the United States having pulled out of that uh, nuclear agreement. Where do you see the situation involving Iran going? Well, uh, we do our utmost to make this agreement deliverable because uh, it was supposed to uh, have uh, perspectives for investors to open up the Iranian market. And there was a tremendous expectation. I've been traveling to Iran over the last 20 years, at least once a year. And I attended various business fora and it was always about what all the perspectives that will be opened up by the JCPOA. And unfortunately, these perspectives didn't materialize uh, for various reasons. Um, and that was long before the United States pulled out. And do you think it's okay for the US to uh, dictate it, its terms to other countries in terms of who they can and cannot do business with? And I wonder whether Austria has any intention of joining uh, a new mechanism, an EU-Iran mechanism that's known as the SPV, the Special Purpose Vehicle, to circumvent these sanctions. We know that uh, the likelihood is that France, Germany and Britain will be in. Will Austria be in as well? It's under discussion between different ministries. It's not uh, the discussion of one ministry. Uh, we, so far, we have not yet seen the conditions of that SPV in clear-cut uh, uh, manner. And I, ask, I put several questions uh, to, um, to the authors of that special purpose vehicle, uh, but it's under discussion. And do you think that Austria should be able to I, do Again, I, I gave you my answer. So it's, it's, it's not wait and my see. decision. It's, a wait it's, and it's, see it's an interministerial decision. Let me ask you about uh, Jerusalem. Uh, last year, Israel invited some 86 ambassadors based in Israel to attend the U.S. Embassy relocation to Jerusalem. I believe Austria was just one of four European countries. I I'm sorry, if I may just correct here. There was a cocktail in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. It was not on the occasion 
of uh, the opening up of the US Embassy. So it's our practice to attend cocktails. Attending a cocktail does not have any legal or political implication. But was Austria, though, supportive of the idea of the US no. relocating its no. embassy? No, no not Because at all. many people interpreted it Yeah, well, such. again, we are here with interpretation, and one should stick to the facts. There was a cocktail in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel, and uh, that was the day before the opening of the embassy. The reception at the day of the opening up of the embassy was not attended by us. So are you saying unequivocally that Austria, this neutral country that everyone knows as a, a bulwark of, you know, as a strong defender of international law, has not changed its perspective no, when it comes to ever. Jerusalem? Because have you ever heard somebody attending a cocktail and Daba creating international law? So where do you stand specifically on this issue then? Well, of course, we, we consider the annexation of East Jerusalem and of other parts uh, as illegal. As going against international law, yeah. definitively. Against well, UN Security Council resolutions. Nine, East Jerusalem was annexed in 1980 and there has been consequential protest against that. Interesting, though, that you once made this statement. You said uh, about Israel, I have the impression that Israel often gets measured by a particularly tall measuring stick. Yes. And, I, and I believe that the relationship between Israel and Europe could need a, an injection of realism, you say. This is something that Austria is actively working on. Israel's neighbors are not Switzerland and Liechtenstein. It would do Europe good to remember this sometimes. Yes. But, but my question is, none of the neighbors of Switzerland or Liechtenstein are occupying uh, the the territory of another country, as you well know, having lived in Lebanon, is the case with the Bekaa Farms, with the Golan Heights, with the whole of Palestine, with the fact that settlements continue every single day. Definitely. Israel is a nuclear power yeah. state. Uh, a lot of people liken it to an apartheid state, yet you say it is being measured with an incredibly tall measuring stick. Yes, definitely, because when we, uh, just like uh, let us take, uh, I've been there during two intifadas, and uh, the intifadas were definitely an uprising uh, everybody was taken by surprise, including the PLO, Palestinian leadership were taken by surprise by the first intifada in 1987. And it was uh, highly watched, broadcasted, etc. in 1987-88. Um, and when we see uh, the, uh, the traumatic war situation in uh, neighboring countries, such as Syria, I also happened to, uh, to, to be as a child during Black September in Jordan, but I remember the corpses of Black September. So um, again, we should, uh, we should keep everything in perspective and Israel has violated and keeps on in violating international law when it comes to, for instance, uh, uh, topics such as uh, settlements in the occupied territories. But there are many other topics where there is a much more critical eye on Israel acting uh, with regard to what is going on in, in the region by and large. That's what I wanted to make my point on that. But I cannot uh, impede anybody from, again, here also over-interpreting, and uh, that's, that's up to everybody. But I, also when I was a correspondent, I always tried to remain to the facts and to what, uh, and not to overdraw, to overstretch a phrase. Sticking to the facts is what we try to do specifically by interviewing uh, people like you to set the record st straight. Just looking back briefly and then forward for a moment, in 1979, Chancellor Bruno Kreisky, himself a Jewish, was the first Western leader to, at the time, host PLO chairman Yasser Arafat. In those days, Austria, many people would have said, was really on the map. Before being Chancellor, Kreisky was Minister of Foreign Affairs. My question is, can Karen Kneissel, also an independent politician, Minister of Foreign Affairs, one day become Chancellor of Austria in a way that might put Austria on the map like it was in the old days? Well, I think Austria is very much on the map now. And the old days, you should uh, also bear in mind, uh, our neutrality was in the midst of the Cold War was a completely different geopolitical situation. Uh, Bruno Kreisky could, as statement, uh, together with other neutral countries like Sweden or his colleagues in Finland, uh, the non-aligned movement, the neutral and non-aligned, it was a completely different uh, system of, of international affairs. And just to make also a distinction between Bruno Kreisky and myself, Bruno Kreisky, whom I respect a lot, unfortunately I never met him, but he was not an independent. He was a socialist uh, with every cell of his heart. And uh, I have respect for everybody who makes his or her career through a political party, but I myself chose a different way. 
And maybe my life could have been easier when I was a junior diplomat uh, to belong to a political party. I quitted diplomacy 20 years ago because I felt the pressure of political parties. And I made my professional and other way by being an independent. And Bruno Kreisky was uh, the, the head of the Social Democrat Party. So that's also a big difference. Uh, finally, if I can, just uh, uh, have you tell us a little bit of what you think in terms of where the world is moving to these days. I'm thinking about the Trump phenomenon and what it means for the rest of the world. America first, the increasing protectionism, the diminishing of the global order in the world. Uh, it was interesting for me to read your statements in a recent interview in which you said none of uh, President Trump's statements um, gave you any cause for concern. That was surprising, despite the trade wars and the migration issues and the walls and, and the I, I don't I the don't remember now that I said that I gave such a statement. I don't recall that. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I always say I refrain from commenting other people's statements. This is not my work. I was an analyst. If you had asked me this question one and a half years ago, I could have elaborated uh, on it in all kinds of details as long as I was a commentator, an analyst, a teacher of international relations. But having turned into a minister, my task, at least that's the way I personally see it and practice it, is not in commenting, but in making my own work as a minister operative. And that's why I try to be active. Sure, and being active, you're here in Davos, having met a lot of people, having talked a lot about the main theme that people are discussing here, globalization in the uh, fourth industrial age. W what are your main thoughts about the changing dynamics in the world and the way in which the world is moving? Of course, again, with the fears of a global uh, slowdown that many people here are talking about. I mean, it's, 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 it's very clear that the social question is back. Uh, and this was maybe underestimated by some uh, people responsible, whether in uh, media, whether in uh, economic uh, affairs or in, in political responsibility. Uh, the name of the game today, and I discussed it yesterday with some of my counterparts, such as Christine Lagarde and also uh, people in the oil business, the name of the game today is affordable mobility, affordable energy. We have seen it again and again when, for instance, subsidized oil prices, wherever that was the case, were cut. That led to social unrest. Now, inside the European Union, we don't have subsidized uh, oil, uh, uh, petrol or gasoline, uh, but we have highly taxed petrol and gasoline. So when you raise the taxes there, as was the case in one important EU country, uh, then that can lead uh, to social turmoil. Finally, Madam Minister, my last question. You and I were on a panel yesterday that I moderated on the, the, the Eurasia region and the increasing dynamics there uh, in light of uh, China's growing influence. Uh, from a European perspective, how do you see that region and the emerging economies of Central Asia and the Caucasus, which a lot of people are focusing quite a bit of attention on? Well, uh, Central Asia has always been on the map as what Harold Mackinder in 1904 called the heartland. And the thesis of Harold Mackinder, the famous British geographer, who can be considered the father of modern geopolitics, even though he did not yet use that term, is that whoever controls heartland, as he called it, uh, controls the world. And having taught geopolitics and energy over many decades, I have always referred to Harold Mackinder. Now, when Mackinder wrote his articles on that, he did not think of oil and gas. It was all about strategic depths. Now uh, we speak of oil and gas. And I mentioned it also yesterday that uh, when I went back to some of the publications in the early 1990s, um, the US were there, Turkey was there, Iran, especially when we speak of the Caspian Basin, but not the People's Republic of China. And of course, now People's Republic of China, ever since 2013, with the very detailed uh, going west strategy, as it was called initially, then it turned into one belt, one road. But it all had to do with developing the far west of China. And that then led more and more into Central Asia. So we are here in, a, uh, in the replay of the famous great game that was played by the British against the Persians of 19th century, against the Ottomans of 19th century, and uh, Mr. Brzezinski published his book on the new great game 
uh, in the 90, late 1980s, early 1990s, and uh, he didn't think maybe in those days of uh, the emergence of China the way we have it today. And it's interesting, a lot of people looking at this debate argue that the rise and decline of powers and superpowers will no longer be determined by geostrategy moving forward, by, but by technology. And in the words of President Putin, whoever controls AI, artificial intelligence, will actually rule the world. Do you, actually, do, do you agree with this statement? Uh, my guest reading is geography back and the social question is back. And I always refer to Otto von Bismarck who said geography is the constant factor of history. Madam Minister, thank you very You're much welcome. indeed for speaking to us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.